So Epiphany is a, is a fascinating season, and this may seem strange to you, but it reminded me of, um, of a mouse trap. And I don't know how many of you have, you have used those. I, I really didn't have much experience with those at all, an actual mouse trap, having to catch mice in the house or in the building or the, in the garage or whatever. And uh, when I was on my vicarage and in my internship, um, Teresa and I were in Eugene, Oregon, and it was a small church, and it had a great big field behind it, probably five acres behind this little house. So it was a parsonage, a place for the pastor to, to live. And, and boy, it didn't take us long before we figured out those mice liked it better inside our house than outside of it. And so uh, I, had, I had really never had much experience personally using... We kind of knew, growing up in New York, you're aware of things like mouse traps and other things, but um, I had never set one myself. So the first time I tried to set one, I think I snapped myself about four times. Um, if you ever try to set one of those. And finally, I found one that was dummy proof. But those first ones, you know, the really cheap ones that you buy, and they just have a little metal tab, and you're trying to set that. And, you're, and you know, the best bait is peanut butter, right? Put that peanut butter on there so they can't take it and run away. They got to stay there until they get it, and until they get what's coming to them. So anyway, um, but you, you know, they're tricky. They're, they're under such tension so that they can do what they want. I mean, and, and, the, and the slightest thing can kind of set them off, but if they're done properly, it's really quite a, I mean, even we even say that it's kind of the invention in which all others are compared. If you make, to make a million dollars, you're going to make a better mousetrap, right? I mean, so it's a very, very simple, but very effective, but it can get you, can't it? Because it's under such tension. I don't know about you, I'm going to, Posit, and I'm going to suspect that a fair amount of you sitting in the room here understand the idea of being under tension. Um, and you know, a mousetrap only works if it's under tension properly, right? It only really works and is effective. I think there are times in my life where I go, boy, I wish all that tension would just go away. I wish I could, life could just be easy and it could be comfortable and it could be smooth. And I think sometimes people think that's the promise of Christianity, that my life will have no tension or stress or right that kind of thing in it anymore. What I want you to know, what I treasure about this season of Epiphany is that I love that Epiphany, it's, in, it's an in-between season. So you have this wonderful celebration of God becoming a human being at Christmas. That's the joy of, of the Christmas celebration. God became a human being to save us. And then, of course, you have the season that is the cross season, Lent, and Lent and its culmination in victory in Easter. But in between those two seasons is Epiphany. And I love how the church throughout the centuries has said, we're going to choose passages which shine light on who the Messiah is. So from that time of his birth until the time he goes to the cross and then rises from the dead, we want to know who this is. How can we see our Savior most clearly? Because epiphany literally means bringing light, right? Shining light. So, on the one hand, Christ is the light of the world. So, He shines His own light, right, on things. But then, epiphany in Scripture also chooses to shine light on Christ, in which it is not easily evident of who He is and what His glory is. For example... If you look at that symbol against the back wall, do you see glory or humility and shame, tragedy? Do you see triumph? See what I'm saying? And so it reminds me of an old story. There was a story of a policeman. He's out and he sees a guy out in the street. It's at night, pitch back, and, he's, and there's a, light, a street light shining down a light. And he sees this guy on his hands and knees you know, in the light of the street light, and he goes over and he says, what's wrong? He says, he thinks he's maybe drunk or he's lost or whatever. And the guy's completely coherent. He goes, oh, no, no, I, I lost my car keys and I got to find him to get home. So the cop goes, man, I know what that feels like. Let me help you. So they're both looking and, you know, they're looking in the light of the street light and they're looking for a while and the, and the policeman goes, you know, I'm not seeing anything here. Are you sure this is where you lost him? He says, oh, no, I lost him over there. But it's too dark over there. The light's better here. 
And that's the interesting tension of the season of Epiphany in which there are some moments in Epiphany in which the brightness of Christ's light shines boldly. At Jesus' baptism, right? A, a star shines above. Boom. The wise men go, where is he? We know he's here. Where's the king of the Jews? Big light, right? And then Jesus' baptism. And the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, right? The Trinity is revealed, the triune God. And then you see Jesus in miracles. And, in trans and this season culminates in transfiguration where Jesus goes up to the top of the mountain. Here's Moses and Elijah, two rock stars of Jewish history. And they're with Jesus. And the disciples are like, wow. And so it's unmistakable. The light is shining brightly on Christ. But Epiphany also prepares us for Lent in which the glory of Christ is hidden in a cross. It's disguised in suffering. Um, Cheryl, thanks for honoring the word reading today. And those verses from Isaiah are what we're going to look at. But especially in particular, this certain one that I believe reveals a tension. And this is why I share this with you. Because I think if we're honest, we deal with lots of tensions in our life. And how do we carry both of those things together? Not ignoring one or hoping it goes away, but understanding that that tension together is significant. And often it's in that tension point where Christ and his gifts are most clearly revealed. And let me give you an example. Here's some terms, and I've written some down. I want to make sure I get this right. For instance, in this epiphany season, we're going to look at Christ as um, he's the, the, the star, he's the king of the Jews. Jim preached about him being the, the re liberator from slavery and bondage to, right? Slavery and slavery to sin and bondage. Uh, he's, last week we looked at Jesus as uh, he resisted temptation of the devil, right? So he's like a resistance fighter who hangs in there and he does successfully what we are unable to do and certainly what our first Adam was unable to do. He resisted temptation. He's perfect. And he does it understanding our hunger, our thirst, our suffering. He understands it. And then we have, a, and then later we have Jesus as a great healer, miraculously healing. He raises from the dead, raises Zach, um, um, uh, Lazarus from the dead. He's declared in the line of David, the most famous king in Jewish history. All of those are glorious, aren't there? And it's not hard to imagine that we see Jesus in those moments. But there are other terms that we use. For instance, as followers of Christ, we are sinner and saint at the same time, aren't we? We are eternal beings stuck on a timeline. We are flesh and blood and also spirit, which Paul tells us is that which inherits the kingdom of God, right, in the resurrection. We are, um, we are Jesus Christ himself is revealed as both fully human and fully divine. Jesus Christ is a perfect lamb of God who becomes sin on our behalf. There's some tension there, isn't there? Where's the balance? How do we do that? I know how this is for me in my own life. It's hard. What's the balance that I have? In how, how strong do I? How gentle? How patient? How urgent? What do I do with my fears as well as my faith, my doubts, and sometimes my anxieties as well as my confidence and my victory? How do I handle loss and hurt? Would you agree with me? There are tensions in there that Christ is longing to speak into in this moment. And I think he speaks into it. Can you go back one slide for me? This slide right here. I want you to read this with me. I can almost never, I need you to because I, might, I, I struggle sometimes emotionally to read these. Isaiah 53, for me, are the most powerful words in all of the Old Testament. And the words that Cheryl read that go on, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. Do you hear the tension in there? Right? So let's read these together. Would you join me? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. See, the author of Isaiah knows what gets our attention. Beauty, power, authority, command of the situation, expertise, acclamation, right? 
None of that is there, is it? Not a bit. And yet it was the punishment that brought him. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was wounded for our iniquities. Right? I love this, people. I don't, this is a little different sermon today because my real hope is that you'll go out today saying, what a great Jesus we have. And I hope you'll be encouraged that in all the ordinary ways of life, you can see Christ just as, if not more clearly, than we do even in his glory. So go on to the next one, Mel, if you would. So these next ones, we look for God. How do we look for God? In glory, in power, and in out of the ordinary, right? You can just fill those in. We see, that's where we see him, right? It's easy. When you go through the Bible, you see him all over. Feeding 5,000, raising from the dead. Light shines. You know, heavens open. Voices come from the sky. Uh, he walks on water. He, all kinds of things. We see Jesus in all of those power and glory and out of the ordinary. And you know what's interesting is the church actually chose to reflect that. After the church became a legal religion in the 4th century, Constantine, the church quickly went to try to go from a position of being humble and persecuted. I mean, they, it was put upon them. They didn't choose that. They were, they were being martyred and killed and demeaned and marginalized. And once they became a religion and then become the state religion of the Roman Empire, they went whole hog the other way, didn't they? And they started wearing funky clothes and weird hats and they started making bishops and cardinals and popes and then we made buildings and the buildings. And now let me put the best possible spin on this. What they meant to say was, God is glorious and full of mercy and love and he rules the universe and we should have buildings and we should have people who serve him that reflect the strength and the power and the authority of God in us. And I think there's nothing wrong with that in this sense. That is right and good. Aren't all of these correct? God is in power. Who else could crush the serpent's head, the devil's head? Who else could save all people for all time? Who else transcends time and space with the power of his word creates life? Right? There's power and there's glory and all those things. And rightly so, we should worship and we should kneel and bow down before our Lord. And because he is way out of the ordinary. But that is not how Christ came to us. He came in humility. He came in the ordinary. He announced himself to the shepherds. And he was carried in the arms of a peasant teenage girl. He didn't live in royalty in palaces and instead grew up in a dusty backwater. Get where I'm going? It's not either or. It's both and. Oh, yes, praise God, we have a God who with power and authority can do all the things He has promised to do. We need a God that good, that powerful, and that strong. But we need a God so loving that He would come to where we cannot miss Him. And yet we so often do. He comes in the most ordinary of things. We find God, what we discover in this Isaiah passage, we see Him in weakness. We see Him where things are weak. And He comes in His own weakness, submitting Himself to humanity, hunger, <laughs> thirst, emotion, sadness, longing, the heartache and the heart joy of love. We see him in humility and in suffering who became sin, who walked into the waters of the Jordan to identify with sinners who needed that cleansing water. We see that Jesus who is patient and puts up with his disciples who struggle to get it and who argue about who's great. And he endures the nails, the flogging, and even prays and wishes God's grace and mercy upon those who are harming him. And we see him in the ordinary. You know, who of us got up this morning and said, boy, I hope I'm ordinary today. <laughs> right? Don't we live in, a, in an age of acclamation and superlatives? I mean, I, I got to tell you this, very, very proud of our school which was accredited for the second time. So 
five years ago, and then now with the full high school, it's another round of accreditation. And last time, it received a, a kudos for powerful practices. Like a powerful practice kind of means you're almost kind of unique as a school, and this is a practice that you should share with others. This year, we got two. So we got two recognized for two powerful practices. And so um, strong, strong marks for our school. Isn't that what you want? Man, we want an extraordinary school. So I want you to hear me right on this because of course we do. Of course we do. But we never want to miss God in the ordinary. That's my point. Of course we strive to be extraordinary. I mean, we want our kids to accomplish and we want us to learn and we want to be great. We want to win our basketball games. I mean, we want to have scholarships and we want to be able to be a great church that's doing cool things for the community as good or as anybody, you know. We want to do all those. So, but I want to do that in a, such a way that we never miss Christ in the ordinary. You know what percentage of high school athletes become professionals? 0 0.08. Less than one-tenth of one percent. So if you're in that mix, praise God. Wow. What an opportunity. I mean, what an opportunity. Um, but less than one-tenth of one percent go on. So it's awesome. I love sports. People who know me love sports. But, you know, you got to sometimes wonder where we're making all our investment, right? Because I want my kids to be in heaven. So I love it when our kids share faith with us as well as passion. But isn't that interesting? So to be honest, almost all high school athletes are ordinary. They're ordinary. But we don't wake up saying, boy, I wish I was. But I will tell you this, the way Christ is apprehended, the way our Savior is, is, is reached and understood and welcomed is because He is so ordinary. He is not so far above us that we cannot understand Him nor reach Him. He is not so far away from us, so aloof, so intelligent, uses such vocabulary, is, has such behavior that we cannot understand nor love Him, but rather He enters into every ordinary moment of our life that we might welcome Him. Here is the things that I'm hoping you hear today, and I'm going to finish. I tell stories, so I'm going to tell you three stories that I hope bless you. But here's the thing. There was nothing in us. You hear what it says? There was no beauty or majesty in Him to attract us to Him. It goes both ways. There was no beauty or majesty in us that drew Him to, our, to, our, to us. It was, in fact, our weakness. It was, in fact, our suffering. It was, in fact, that we are so needy that Christ was drawn to us and the joy of the stories I'm going to tell you next is this is the kind of Savior we have because he found us in the ordinary and he made us children of God he counted us worthy to walk the road to Calvary and to grant us eternal life and the irony is that it was there that we found him in his weakness in his humility, in his suffering. The ordinary Jesus. Just like you. And not like you. And we have found him because we were drawn to him in his weakness. Soren Kierkegaard tells a very, very famous story. Danish theologian from the previous century tells of a prince who wanted to find a maiden suitable to be his queen. Well, one day while running an errand in the local village for his father, he passed through a poor section of town. As he glanced out the window of the carriage, his eyes fell upon a beautiful peasant maiden. During the ensuing days, he often passed by the young lady and soon fell in love with her. But he had a problem. How would he seek her hand in marriage? He could order her to marry him, but even a prince wants his bride to marry him freely and voluntarily and not through coercion. He could put on his most splendid uniform and drive up to her front door in a carriage drawn by six horses. But if he did this, he would never be certain that the maiden loved him or was simply overwhelmed with all the splendor. 
As you might have guessed, the prince came up with another solution. He would give up his kingly robe. He moved into the village, entering not with a crown, but in the garb of a peasant. He lived among the people, shared their interests and concerns, and talked their language. In time, the maiden grew to love him for who he was and because he had first loved her. In the middle of the night, there's a small voice that penetrated the stillness. It came from the bedroom across the hall. Daddy, I'm scared. And out of our groggy, fuzzy, sleepy state, you say, sweetie, don't be afraid. Daddy's right across the hall. After a brief pause, the little voice is heard again. I'm still scared. Always quick with a theological insight. You say, you don't need to be afraid. God is with you. God loves you. This time the pause is longer, but the voice returns. Daddy, I don't care about God. I want someone with skin on. (laughs) And this one's my favorite. Years ago, this is a reporter. Um, I remember seeing the the reports of a coal mining accident in the Allegheny Mountains of Pennsylvania. Many miners escaped with their lives, but three men were still trapped somewhere deep within the earth's crust. Whether they were dead or alive, no one knew. What made the accident even more threatening to life was the presence of intense heat and noxious gases within the mine itself. If the men had not been crushed by the rock, they well could have been asphyxiated by the fumes or killed by the heat. Two days went by before a search expedition was allowed to even enter the mine because of the heat and fumes. Even then, there was great danger in store for anyone who would dare descend into what could well be a deep black grave. I don't remember what happened to those three men, but I remember is a, de- is a brief interview conducted with one of the members of the search party as he was preparing to enter the mine. A reporter asked him if he knew of the noxious gases and the extreme danger of the mine, and the man said, yes. And you're still going down? And the man said, those men may still be alive. Without another word of explanation, he put on his gas mask, climbed into the elevator, and descended into the black inferno of the mine. And Jesus says, in response to every objection, are you still going down? And he says, they may still be alive. What a great Jesus we have. May you look and rejoice in God occupying those ordinary moments, in those moments in which we can find him and see him, for that is where he found you. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you for this season of Epiphany, shining light. Lord, it's easy to see you in glory and power and authority. It's easy to see you on Easter Sunday. It's easy to see you on Christmas Day. But Lord, in the meantime, you who took on such humility and our full humanity and who walked in our midst and endured our weaknesses and our shame, that's where you found us. And that, Lord Jesus, is where we found you. We thank you for being present. And may we see you always in the extraordinary grace you give to even the most ordinary. In Jesus' name, amen.